Welcome to Social Sessions, where we dive deep into the hearts and minds of those who champion social justice. Today we are truly privileged to host a remarkable individual. He's not an activist, he's a living legend in the fight for social equality. Join me in extending the warmest of welcomes to the extraordinary Tommy Sheridan. How are you doing, Tommy? I'm fine. Um, Sean, thank you for a, a very kind introduction. Um, as my, most of my friends would say, it's legend not legend, <laughs> um, but that's just the way Glasgow is. Uh, you'll get your mates taking the piss and that's that's just, a, that, that keeps your feet on the ground. So um, what I did just with everybody, Tommy, is just kind of take them back um, to their own kind of childhood growing up in Glasgow. And that was Pollock, what Pollock went to, you grew up. Um, obviously Pollock's a lot of kind of trouble in its past. What was it like for you growing up? Sean, I've got to say, uh, born in Govan, uh, moved to Pollock at age of two, so I never ever knew Govan. Uh, grew grew up in Pollock, Lintenhall Road, 265 Lintenhall Road, um, it was a, a top uh, tenement building, top floor. Um, I remember my mum used to explain that it was wonderful compared to what we were in, which was a single end in Govan, um, across for the Lyceum. Um, and she used to talk about how it even had a wee uh, porthole windy because the verandas <laughs> in the days had the wee porthole windies. Um, and of course, you know, that was unique uh, in those days. And uh, we had a veranda that looked out on a, a, a great on the Linnell Road, and there was a wee forest there, and Bonnie Home Avenue, and it was down there with a big football park. My whole uh, childhood, Sean, I, I I know we we read the as you all get older you read all about the statistics and the poverty. We didn't know any of that, right? Because Aye. we were on the same boat, you Aye. know. Uh, uh, right now, I've got a, a couple of mates that I went to nursery with uh, Nelly and, and John Young. Uh, I was away recently in Alicante where I'm at a walk in football. Um, we're still good mates, and they remind me of uh, primary school and how uh, they all went to Belgium primary six or primary seven and I was supposed to go uh, my name done but I had to pull out because my ma had was in debt and couldn't afford to pay and all that and that was probably the first ever instance of like missing out on something Aye. that I was aware of um, and it, I, I, when my ma was alive I used to tell her it scarred me for life and, all that. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she used to go mental uh, but but the point was that it was a it was a housing scheme we all lived in tenements we all lived in closes um, we had to get on with people um, some areas of Pollock you had to be careful uh, where you came from other people didn't come in right. and you didn't go into there right. but uh, you know we had the cross and the crew and then we had the 21 crew and the 50 crew and you know all <laughs> uh, Obviously, territorialism was a big thing. And when we were younger, me and Paul, could, we used to hang a, a boot with some of the older guys thinking it was cool. Uh, and they were nicking a boot with big blades and the big crombie coats so they could hide uh, the, 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 the machetes and all that. And they used to go up with the Crookston Hill, um, near the, where, where I stay, where Crookston Castle is. And that's where they would arrange to meet with guys for the cross. And it was pure theatre. It right. was, you know, a chase and a chase and a chase, back and forth, back and forth. Nobody ever got hot. They were all carrying and all that. So if, 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 if any of them actually ended up in actual confrontation, somebody could have got hot. Uh, but my whole life uh, in Pollock was just nothing but positive memories, Sean. I, I, I can't even, um, say anything other than that. At a very early age, around about the age of 10, I got involved with Paul United um, Football Club. Um, my next, my guy next close to me, a guy called Mr Little, seen us playing football down at the wee grass triangle across from my, from my house. And uh, he said, oh, you should come and play for Paul United, son. You look as though you, you know what you're doing. And I thought, oh, I, I don't know where is it. Howford School, down at Howford School, um, end up meeting a lot of guys, some who went to school, some most of right. went to other schools. And it was it was a brilliant experience because in these days, I went to a Catholic primary, I went to a Catholic secondary, and therefore your mates were Catholics, uh -huh. you know? know. Um, but in the scheme you stayed in, there was Protestants as well. Uh -huh. And uh, as it happens, uh, while I was growing up, my good Catholic mates were, were brilliant, but I started to get some proddy mates as well. And uh, we, we became mates via Paul United. And Paul United became our fulcrum for the whole community because we had a training 
two nights a week with a football on a Saturday and a Sunday, but we also had the famous how for discos on a Friday night. And <laughs> they were absolutely brilliant because that's where you would go to try and, you know, get halfway a bird uh, and, uh, you know, everybody would slag you. You were, a, you were either a mod or you were a poser or you were a teddy boy, you know. And it was just a, it was just the fulcrum of Pollock, uh, or that, my part of Pollock. Pollock's a big area. Uh, when I'm talking about Pollock, I, uh, geographically, it would be described as North Pollock. Aye. Because if you think people who stay in Priest Hill, Nitz Hill, sometimes they would say they stay in Pollock. Aye. And I would say, no, no, you stay in Priest Hill, you know. Uh, or if uh, people stayed in uh, Central Pollock, like uh, Langton Road or Old Pollock, I wouldn't describe that as my Pollock, you know. So it was a massive, massive sprawling scheme um, but the the club Paul United became an absolute uh, tube of glue that stuck the community together. We thought something like that, and which is which is why I I just love to see community groups and, and particularly football teams, but other types of community groups being there because see without them, Sean, what what do you do? No, no. You know what 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 else? Have you element got? of community, and I know like um, in a lot of places, you know, um, there's a kind of. I don't know, it's just there's nothing for the young boys today. And it seems to be, I don't know if it's social media, I don't know. Well, I can say in that when I was growing up, there still is that wee element of community. Um, I was maybe growing up, I grew up coming old, Tommy, 2000, so like, I was like two, the 90s, 2000. But there was that element of community. No, I don't see it. Like, right. you, you speak to maybe one or two of your neighbours and you say hello, and it's just not the same as like the way you. The way you see, like, your, your dad's family and your man's family and that, the way they were growing up. There's no doubt, Sean, there's a, there's a huge shift generationally. I mean, you you were maybe brought up, I don't know whether they're still in that generation where um, parties with your aunties, your uncles, you know, whether it's Christmas, whether it's birthdays, there was any occasion whatsoever, it was an excuse <laughs> to get a, a swally <laughs> and a sing song. Um, and my ma used to go mental when she was still uh, alive. She used to say, you don't have parties any longer. You don't have sing songs. All these yeah. days, he's uh, off sitting in a house and talk and you don't have any actual interaction. And she was right in that respect. So I think because we we've, we've got so much technically now in terms Aye. of all the social media and all that, I think we take for granted conversation and actually Definitely. talk to people. I do worry. Sometimes I go into like when I'm travelling into university, I'll go on the bus or I'll use the subway and nobody talks to each no. other anymore. You know, whereas when we were young, you know, ah, you just talk to other people. Right? Exactly. It was just you just fired in, you know, and and and, and talked away, but. I just hope that's no that art of conversation isn't it, getting lost completely, you know? I think with the with the young ones and that it could be, Tommy. Um so looking back, obviously I'm going to take your kind of political career, because obviously you had a you had a big, big, big kind of influence on a lot of Scottish socialist people. And um so how did that start, Tommy? Because I know there was a big um it was, it was the poll tax thing and all that that was huge. And but how did you actually start getting into politics? Sean, very, very quickly, my my Mother was very influential in me getting into politics. As I grew up, uh, my mum, like many, many mums uh, in, in my sort of a uh, social milieu, uh, she left school, no qualifications, she worked in pubs, she did cleaning jobs, sometimes she had two or three jobs at, at once. Um, and then as she got involved with the, the, the pubs and the bar trade, generally she joined the trade union and she became quite a good organiser for other people to join the trade unions. And they used to campaign for things that we take for granted now as far as pubs are concerned, getting paid for overtime. You know, she, she, one of her bugbears was uh, once the pub shut, they had to clean up and, and get it ready for the next day, but they never ever get paid for it. They also struggled to get home at night because the buses were mostly half by the time, so they had to pay out their own money for taxis. So she got the staff involved and got them into unions and uh, tried to get the union to organise uh, negotiations with the big brewers to pay proper rates of pay and conditions, recognise sickness pay, holiday pay, uh, overtime pay, uh, expenses for travel, uh, getting to keep their tips. That, that was it's another basic thing. Basic stuff, isn't it? Basic stuff that, as I say, people take for granted now. But at the time, um, my mom was, was coming up against a a very stuffy-nosed, hard-nosed 
bunch of millionaires that didn't want to pay any decent money, very much like it is the new. And um, Tenant Caledonian was the big daddy in those days in terms of uh, the breweries. So they wouldn't recognise the union, they wouldn't negotiate with the union. Um, and my ma said, well, we're going to organise a strike. And they laughed at her, you know, they, 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 they poo-pooed her and pff, straight away you go, they pick at every pub and all that. Uh, people will just go to another pub. So they, they, they looked down their nose at her. However, uh, my mom was quite ingenious in that. Not just her, obviously with all her organisers. And what they did is they didn't pick at the pubs. They pick at, picketed the breweries. And right. in the 80s, the brewery drivers were all in the union. So Aye. all the big brewery drivers wouldn't cross the picket line. <laughs> Within two days... The one, the the, 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 the the pubs when they get the delivery of their drink, <laughs> and of course the breweries are going mental. Oh, no, no, we we'll need, we we'll need to sell, we we'll need to sell, and they recognise the union. They rec they gave them proper conditions. So she went for that to then becoming a full time organiser for the TGWU, as it was called then. It's now called Unite, um, and then they encouraged her to go to college, adult college, New Battle Abbey College, through in uh, near Edinburgh, uh, where she she did trade union studies, then. She uh, had an interest in children and social work and um, she became qualified as a social worker and she worked with kids. She worked with the RS, we called the RSSPCC in those days, the Royal Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. They had a, an office uh, just off Duke Street um, and my mum worked with abused kids um, and uh, a lot of that work was intense, you know. Yeah, I can't However, all that stuff there that I'm telling you about, she then got involved in a way well, when she was doing the trade union work, she got involved in a movement which was relatively new, and it was called the Battered Wives Movement. Aye. Um, and this was dead frightening for me, Sean, as a boy growing up, because my mom would get phone calls during the night, you know, completely unplanned, and it would be women on the other end of the phone greeting, uh, they'd been hurt, they'd been assaulted, but they'd know where to go. People used to say, we abusive partners, just leave them. No, no, it, was and, a, it wasn't uh, a thing, wasn't it? No, course, wasn't it? it was just like, the police, I mean, it was only, the police brought in, it wasn't that long, like, they brought in like domestic stuff, well, and that was like, the, growing they, up. they take it much more seriously now, Sean, but in those days it was, oh, what goes on behind closed doors, that's up to you, and the police went to the end. So she got involved in this movement called the Battered Wives Movement and their task was to try and get a refuge so that when you said to a woman, just leave them, Aye. they actually was somewhere safe for that woman to go Aye. where Wayne's. Um, and my mom would get called out loads of nights and I'd be dead worried because I'm thinking, this of guy course. could hit my mom, you know. Aye. I used to greet and all that as a, as a kid. Um, but that movement developed, my mom got the TGW to back it financially and they built the first refuge and that woman, that movement became Women's Aid, which That's we, amazing which, now. Which, which, we, that, which, we, which we all recognise now. Uh, so I was very, very proud of my mom for her involvement in that type of stuff. But that's what gave me my political grounding. I, I think, it, you don't know it at the time, right? But you kind of understand that your values and your your attitudes, they grow for your parents Definitely. and the, the things that they're telling you. Uh, I can remember one, I don't want to go on and on and on about it, but I remember uh, one particular time I'd only been, I was either eight or 10, because it was either 72 or 74, right? So I'm either eight or 10. Um, and I remember having all my wee soldiers. I used to love them playing all the wee plastic soldiers and <laughs> had them all laid out and <laughs> fired things at them. And, and uh, action men, uh, I, you know, you're probably too uh, young to remember always. action men, but uh, guys my age, I mean, <laughs> realistic gripping hands and real hair and all that <laughs> stuff. I mean, that was our, that was the bit of our toys, right? Um, and I remember having all they do and the lights went out. Aye. We'd need ne nearly and my mom and we had candles all that around the house. And I was quite upset, you know, I can't even play with my soldiers. And my mom sat and told me why the lights went out. And it was because of these workers that, that go deep into the grun. Very, very dangerous job in order to get this thing called coal. And when they bring this thing called coal up, we burn this thing called coal. It gives us the electricity, and the electricity is what gives us Aye. the lights. Uh, but these men uh, are getting paid very little wages and they're striking to get better wages. Uh, and that's why the lights are out and, and we should be supporting them. And 
I'm like, oh, I just want to put my sojis. <laughs> what are you so this up? But you know what, Sean? That story stuck with the Aye. fact that I'm 59 years of age and I'm telling you that Aye. story shows you how much it's stuck in my, my stuck. mind and how much it's instilled those values of uh, social justice, of fairness, uh, and support for the trade union Aye. movement. Um, so that led me at a very young age, I meet guys and, and lassies now for school who will tell me things that I forgot about modern studies classes. You, you remember that Friends Reunited, you have uh, uh, Get It Giller and all that. Class of 2000. Exactly, aye, aye. exactly. <laughs> um, you go and you meet your like, can't even recognise anybody <laughs> and they're all talking to you. But the point is, uh, they say that I used to argue like hell in uh, the modern studies classes. And the truth is, um, what my ma had installed in me was that battling attitude, social justice, things that are rang. Um, and by the time I'm at school, I'm obviously articulating. I'm without knowing it. It's aye. all unconscious. Aye, aye. I'm no... I, I listen to people uh, when I read memoirs and books, they are the rich and famous, and some of them talk about how... Uh, I'm trying to remember the big building tycoon uh, who uh, famously tossed a coin to decide whether he joined the Labour Party or the Tory Party. He, he knew he was going to have a political career, he just didn't know in which party yet, which, which is the way they looked at politics. Aye. Politics to them was a career. Aye. Politics for real activists is about changing people's Definitely. lives. It's not about changing your own bank account. It's about changing society. Aye. And unfortunately, politics is so sullied and, and, and dirty uh, with the people that have taken the piss out of it. Um, but I, I was encouraged by my mom to go to university. I, I didn't have a clue, Sean, what I was Aye. doing. I wanted to be a footballer. That was it's quite a wee dynamic between my mom and my dad because my dad ended up taking the football team and I played football with my dad. Uh, I was not a bad uh, footballer and my dad wanted me to be a footballer and my mom wanted me to go to uni. <laughs> um, so it became a wee bit of a, a dynamic. I, I got offered the uh, terms to go to St. Johnston uh, as a, a apprentice. Uh, and, and But it would have meant no going to university and but my dad relented he says look son do what your mom's telling you you're better getting an education right. behind you and all that um so i went to sterling uni at 17 um and i didn't have a clue what i was doing you know i'm like because we're all speaking with is there a class in there talking <laughs> oh about big time i remember sean one of my first uh you go to lectures and there's hundreds there right and they're all talking and you're taking notes and that but when you go to seminars or tutorials as they call them there's only a smaller group, say maybe 10 or 12. Uh, and I remember this first day, we, we were told to read a book by a guy called Kevin Hawkins on the causes uh, of unemployment, uh, causes and consequences of unemployment. Um, and uh, we were in the table and uh, the uh, tutor says to me, so uh, Tommy, what do you think? And, we, and I'm saying, well, you know, unemployment, isn't it just about the status of not having a job, it's mental as well. I, I say because it can it can affect somebody's dignity. You know, for instance, if you go into a pub and somebody says, "Oh, what do you do?" and you say, "Oh, I'm a joiner, I'm a brickie, I'm a train driver, I'm a bus driver," it's your identity. Aye. And if you lose a job, you can sometimes lose your Definitely. identity. So it becomes uh, a mental thing as well. Uh, it's, uh, being on the dole can affect your mental health. And the next guy to speak come in and he says, "Oh, I, I'm really, really sorry." What, what do you mean the door? <laughs> and he <laughs> did the, the boy was the boy was fed down south and he was a nice enough boy. He just didn't know what the door was. <laughs> and I had to explain what the door and that to me summed up. I thought, oh god, this is what the unis like. And Stirling, by the way, wasn't it the worst? Aye, aye. I mean the, lots of unis were what in um, this is nineteen eighty one, right? Aye. Uh it's uh, it's not as bad now, uh, but the class differentials were, were very, very apparent. And what I did, uh, Sean, when I was at uni is I threw myself into it big time because I f kind of was frightened of failing. I thought, because I was the first one in my family. It was the first one in my street and all that. <laughs> you know, it was all, oh, he's going to uni. It was all something dead big, you know. Uh, and uh, I'd been accepted to Glasgow, Strathclyde and Stirling. That was the three unis that I'd applied for. And I didn't have a clue. My mom says, you go to Stirling, son. And I says, why go to Stirling? She says, well, if you go to the other two, you'll need to stay in the house. Aye. She says, and you'll have loads of distractions. And she was so true. Because I was going out with my mates playing football or going to the dance or whatever. 
got to Stirling, didn't know anybody. Aye. I was living my own, I had to learn how to live. I had to knuckle down. And I knuckled Aye. down. And, and I went to the library and I, I started, I mean, up until then, Sean, I had hardly read. I was a terrible reader. And I, if there's one thing I try and instill in my daughter, she's 18 now, not very successfully, I've got to say, because of the uh, accessibility of film. Um, no. But I try to get her to read. Please no. read, darling. Read, read, read. It opens up the world to you. It opens up ideas to you. Makes I you wish I'd done it. it. I wish I'd done it when I was younger. Because um, I just feel as though I've missed out on an awful lot. Um, but it is hard that it encourage youngsters to read now Definitely. when, you know, I say, to her, you know, you should read Grapes of Wrath. Oh, no, I watched it, Dad. Uh, you know, you, 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 <laughs> I know. everything's she, got to hang in. She, 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 she was doing The Great Gatsby as, a, as one of her uh, topics at school in her sixth year. And she's, oh, it's, it's a great book. And she's, oh, no, Dad, I've watched the film. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, you, you, so <laughs> you, you're, know. you're up against it, Sean. But hopefully, she's only 18 now, hopefully she'll realise that sometimes you kind of get everything out of film. Film's Aye. great. Um, theatre is great but but reading I think is, is important um, so when I I done my, my degree um, at university in 1981 um, and I became very involved right away in the labour society I joined the labour society because right. my mom was labour uh, her family was labour uh, joined the labour uh, club um, and that's where I first met um, somebody selling the militant newspaper the militant was a paper that um, was based on a Marxist ideology, a Marxist explanation of society. They were in the Labour Party, but they, they organised uh, within it uh, to promote Marxist policies and more radical outlook within the Labour Party. And I loved them because everybody else was different. Aye. They were quite working class. Mm -hmm. and, and so I gravitated towards them, you know, uh, and I got involved with this group, Militant, um, and I started reading and reading and reading. Um, and I remember saying to one of the, 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 the guys that was selling us, that boy, Davy Brun, um, yeah, I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to read, I'm going to read Marx's da Das Kapital. And he, he, he was nodding his head, but I think he thought, oh, he's half his head, you know. <laughs> uh, but I ended up doing my dissertation on Marx's labour theory of value. So I had to read Das Kapital <laughs> and I had to read loads of stuff in order to do my dissertation in, in 1984. Um, but during that period, I was involved with a Stockport Messenger dispute. Uh, we done to some of the picket lines down in London. Um, went to a lot of militant meetings, learned about what was going on in the world, Cuba, Russia, trying to basically make sense of the world. Aye. Um, so much so that by 1983, 84, you had the beginnings of the, the minor strike, uh, March of, of 84. Um, a lot of people say that the minor strike began in Yorkshire and it didn't, it began in, in Stirling, it was Flynn <laughs> near, near where I was studying they were the first pit to walk out I remember um, Flynn, pretty working class oh aye, aye. massive, my right. Pop, Popeye McCormick was a pit delegate an absolute legend in his lifetime man brilliant, uh, brilliant organiser and uh, great miner uh, miners leader um, and uh, I, I just threw myself right into supporting the minor strike and I, I was quite a it was quite a cathartic experience, Sean, because at first we used to go for the university to the Stirling Miners Welfare, um, which was three or four miles, to get the picket buses Aye. to go to our picket lines. Castle Head, Castle Hall, um, sometimes uh, uh, up in uh, Glenrothes. Um, so it was, we would just go and show our support by being in the picket lines. And within, I'd say, about eight weeks, um, they changed the route and they would bring the picket bus up to the uni and pick us up in the morning. But they, so that was a bit of respect for aye us aye. because I think at first they were sort of a you know, who's just a bunch aye. of students who think they are. As a lot of during that strike, I think a lot of miners had that attitude about people that wanted to help. I mean, if you look at the the film, um, God, what is it called? The one that, that it's, just, it's a story about the LGBT uh, groups leading the miners 
and how at first nobody wanted aye, to get aye. whether it was gay involved with supporting the minors and actually over uh, the period of months it developed they became very good friends and brothers and sisters and couldn't get her care less about aye. the sexuality it was about whether you're supporting the cause that was the most important issue um so the, the, these minors were that at first they were a bit suspicious and then it was well they're, they're coming regular Let, let's take the bus up more aye, again. definitely and i was a i was the picket bus organizer and it's just it's, <laughs> it, it, to this day it's one of my proudest uh titles ever i've, I've got was was being the picket bus organizer um so that sort of i was there's a guy called um sean millen who worked for the Guardian for many, many years, and he wrote a book called The Enemy Within. And The Enemy Within title was taken for a comment that Thatcher made during the miners' strike, where she referred to the miners as the enemy within, which was a... It's outrageous, isn't it, for a prime minister uh, to say that, isn't it? It's an excruciating, horrible, rancid comment to make about uh, a group of men who daily I know. risk their lives to keep the lights on for everybody, know. you know, uh, enemy within. Um, and uh, what his book did is it documents exactly what the state did during that. St if, if, see if anybody's interested at all. Was, in, there, was there like MI5 and stuff and MI6 involved? Uh, this, all, that? This, the, all of that that you've just mentioned is documented in the book. It's no aye, aye. An, a rumour or it's no an accusation. They actually, he tells the story of a guy called Roger Windsor. Uh, Roger Windsor um, becomes the uh, secretary of the National Union of Mine Workers. Um, and uh, during the strike, you'll remember stories were coming out about uh, Libyan gold Aye. supporting the miners, Arthur Scargill's mortgage getting paid by uh, Russian uh, uh, donations. And Propaganda. Like, you're saying, you know, it was a very, very damaging stuff. A guy called Roger Cook uh, did a thing called the Cook Report. I remember that. And he won an award. He won the TV award, a, a documentary of the year, for exposing the story about Arthur Scargill's mortgage getting paid, right? And, of course, it didn't. Right? Aye. But it doesn't matter, right? Aye, it, I know, it's, it, it's irrelevant, it, isn't it? It's like, see if you throw enough shit, Sean. Aye. It doesn't matter whether it's true or no. Some of it will stick, right? And that's what these bastards hope for. They they, they, they know the, the rules of propaganda is, doesn't it matter whether it's true, just throw as much shit as possible and inevitably some of it will stick. Definitely. And it, it then turns people against the individual. And that's what they did with Scargo. They tried to turn people against Scargo, accusing them of benefiting for the right. strike, getting his mortgage paid. This the Libyan gold at the time when they had the hostage situation with, with Libya. Gaddafi was a tyrant apparently and everybody yeah. should be against, oh, the Libya is supporting the miners, so we should all not support the right. miners. It, it was Fuck it. I mean, by the way, it's happening now. You know, that was 84, 85. It's still happening in 23 in terms of Ukraine, in terms of what's happening in Palestine. It, it's just propaganda. Right. It's just, and it's very, very powerful. Always, always question where the story's coming Definitely. from and whose interest the story's getting told. Um, and that book Sean Millen wrote, um, reveals the story of how Roger Windsor was able to get to the position of being the uh, National Secretary of the National Union of Mine Workers at the very heart of the dispute. And he was an MI6 operative. He, he wow. was part, you know, they've got the papers, they've got the, Aye. it's there in the book. Anybody who is interested at all in social history and the anatomy of the state, go and buy the book called The Enemy Within by Sean uh, Millen. Um, that's how deep it went. Aye. Because what they did, somebody else, wasn't it Sean Millen, but some, somebody else described the minor strike as a civil war without bullets. Definitely. Right? And that, to me, highlighted the nature of class society. As me as somebody that was um, trying to learn about Marxist theory and other theories of society, I'm saying class-based society. And there it was, they used the media, they used the social security, they used the law, they used all of the arms of the state to crush the miners. Aye. And why did they do it? Because they recognised that if we crush the miners, then we can crush working conditions for everybody else. Because if you can beat the miners, you can beat Aye. anybody. And yet, 
it was so close. The NACODs vote, which was a, uh, an absolute uh, whisker away from voting to bring uh -huh. them out, and they would have won the straight. If you read uh, Ian McGregor, who was the um, coal board chairman at the time, uh, if you read his memoirs, you'll see that if NACODs hadn't voted against strike, then they were beat. The, 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 oh. They would have had to have caved in, and the Thatcher would have been finished, and uh, uh, all the stuff that happened in the eighties. changed history, oh, Sean, see all the social security changes that come in, uh, attacking working people for uh, being unemployed, being disabled, people um, who couldn't claim benefits, um, pe people who were getting told, that, "Oh, you need to work for your dough," you know, the YTS Aye. schemes and all. That. All of that come in on the back of the defeat of the miners. Uh, a defeat for our class meant a defeat for the whole class. Um, and unfortunately, Scargo tried to warn us of, uh, all about that. Um, but uh, far too many people didn't take his, uh, didn't heed his warnings. Um, so my, that sort of, uh, that whole experience, I've sort of gone about that experience, but it was dead um, important in shaping my life and shaping my outlook. Uh, when I left <clears throat> uni, 1985, um, Liverpool City Council at that stage had taken over for the miners because the miners had had to go back to work in March of 85. Um, their, their heads were bowed. They, they, they weren't they broken, but they hadn't won. Right. Um, and uh, local authority funding had became the big issue. And um, in, at the beginning of 85, quite a few local authorities said, no way are we accepting all these cuts, we're going to fight the Tories, we're going to fight Thatcher. And Liverpool in particular led the way and, and they set what was what was called a needs budget. So when the, the government said to them, right, that's, that's your budget, and the council said, but if we implement this budget, we're going to have to sack people. We can't, we can't yeah. pay uh, the current staff we've got the new, never mind build new houses, never mind improving services. We're not doing that we're going to set a needs budget and we're going to employ more people and we're going to build houses and we're going to give people a, a proper quality of life and massive, massive support. And uh, the, the Tories caved in in 85, which was which was brilliant, but they came back for them in 86 because yeah. all the other... They, they, basically, the Tories didn't want to take on the miners and all the local authorities, particularly Liverpool. So they, they caved in in 85, but then they did the same thing in 86. Liverpool fought again, but this time they were isolated. Uh, no. All the other councils caved in. Lambeth, uh, Sheffield, they all it's caved the way in. it's structured as well. I mean, obviously I studied politics, obviously not the extent you did, Tommy, but I had to have a degree in law and politics. And um, I, when, it was, when I was, I remember when I was studying and I, I seen the constituencies and the way they set out, um, and you look at like the tap and you and they're massive constituencies, huge, huge areas of working class people. And then you go to London and it's so many tiny constituents, which is all it's just set up so that you, the Tories obviously get their votes. Yep. Um but just what you were talking about, I don't know if you've ever seen Oliver Stone's uh, South of the Border. Yeah, um I've not seen South of the Border. I'm a big, big fan of Oliver Stone. I thought you were going to say uh untold history uh, of America. I, 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 he, he wrote Oh, we get a guy called Peter Kuznick, who's a, a professor of history. He wrote a, a series, documentary series called "The Untold History of America." Honestly, Sean, see if you're interested at all in why America is the fucking basket case that it is. Watch that; it is absolutely <laughs> outstanding. Uh, it gives you the real violent-based history of racism, uh, 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 the, the, the very heart of American society, and it tells you, shows you all the lies and the false flags that have justified all sorts of invasions from Korea to Vietnam to Iraq, you name it. I mean, uh, at one stage, I, I think I've I seen one of the figures there that they had bombed 52 countries across the world since 1945 since 1945 you know everybody talks about oh we need to be really worried about china we need to be really worried about uh, uh, russia russia and china having to get military no. bases all across the world but no. america has i mean uh, they tried to land in cuba look what happened exactly exactly <laughs> but, but stone's fantastic i love him i think he's a i i think he's one of those essential prophets that we need a Definitely. time of lies. You know, Orwell used to say that a, a, a time of deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And Oliver Stone is one of those prophets. Yes. He tells the truth. He gets assaulted for it, 
but he tells the truth and uh, his anything that he's attached to, I'll watch, so I'll look out for that. South, one. South of the Borders basically takes you to South America, so um, it's Hugo Chavez, is it? <clears throat> um, and it was obviously about the Chavez's coup and stuff like that, so... I'm pretty um, sure I have seen it now you come in, because it was way Chavez. It was way Chavez, way Chavez, it was Evo Morales. And and what, one, of, one, of my, uh, one of my greatest, proudest moments was to shake Chavez's hand. I know. 2003, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I seen a photo of that when I was researching you. Well, I, what had happened is I'd, I'd, uh, we'd just won our uh, second election in the Scottish Parliament. We'd went from one uh, to six MSPs. Um, and there was a female involved in Glasgow who who'd, uh, was from Venezuela and her sister worked with a Venezuelan oil um, company um, and she was a big supporter of Chavez and she says to me, she says, you know, you should really go and try and build alliances, build support. Right. Uh, why don't you go and, and try and meet with the right. uh, Bolivarian government of Venezuela? And I was like, oh, you think so? And she says, look, I, I could make the arrangements if you could uh, try and get the travel. So uh, my wife, Gail, worked British Airways for 27 years. So she's got access to cheap flights oh, and yeah. all that. My sister says, well, but Venezuela. And she, it, it was Go broken because nobody, nobody was really going to Venezuela <laughs> Go at the time. So, so we were able to get cheap flights. Uh, we went out to Venezuela. And uh, unfortunately, I never got to interview Chavez, which was... Oh. Uh, a blow, but what happened is by the time I got there, it was just after the mini coup where the right wing forces had arrested him and, and attempted a military coup. Uh -huh. Um, and absolutely brilliant. Uh, they, they called it to the barrios of uh, Venezuela, That's amazing Caracas. Everybody just took to the streets and loads of the army because Chavez was army related. Aye. He was a former. He failed. He had a failed coup. He had one failed. That's coup right. That he get jailed. He get jailed. Um, but he uh, was very popular among the rank and file, and loads of them rebelled against uh, the the military, and they overturned the coup leaders and and, and, and well, uh, reinstalled them. President Tommy, the Argentinian president. Um, it was one of the most shocking things I've seen, and it was never ever documented. It was never really, in, but it's in South of the Border, and she says she went and met George Bush, and um, George Bush was obviously against Chavez, and that Chavez, and that kind of shut down the oil, kind of linked to, to America. So she was like, um, look, we're in trouble. Um, socially, we're, we're kind of we're, we're losing a lot. There's a big class difference and stuff, and he went, well, well, let's start a war. And she went, what do you mean? Like, with who? And he's like, well, what do you do is if you back us up against Venezuela, we'll back you. And she was like, what do you mean start? Like, she, she, it, it was just the way she came out with it. And I was like, that's mad. That's a president telling you that somebody's just went, let's go and blow up a country for nothing, but like, we'll back you up. And it's obviously <clears throat> looking into Iraq and looking into, I mean, obviously we'll go into there and you were a massive, massive um, supporter of, uh, the, the, against, against the war in Iraq. But, the whole thing is that Tony Blair, George Bush went into that country on a false lie that they knew was false. Oh, and how many people, over a million people killed? Over a million. Um, no, if you take, I've always said this, and I know people say it's different, but if you take the, the definition of a murder in Scotland, the definition of murder is premeditated murder or wicked recklessness. No, at the very least, you must say that's wickedly Wicked reckless. reckless. Yeah. Um, so what, what was you? Obviously, you have um, you have your kind of. Uh, you were probably privy a lot more. What actually went on there, Tommy? Like what? Because what, what you've said is. I mean, I, I made a speech in the Scottish Parliament um, in two thousand and two, um, where I said, for those of you who think this prepared invasion is about weapons of mass destruction. It's time for you to waken up and smell the oil. And that's true. what it was. So true. That's what it was. Right. The, the, the fuck all to do with weapons of mass. For fuck's sake, they knew where the weapons were because they fucking sold them to Saddam Hussein. <laughs> the biggest, the biggest arms sales. People have to just shake no. themselves here. Here's two examples. Saddam Hussein was funded by the CIA and America when he was fighting Iran. 
So during Iran, Iraq, a war, who did we support? We supported Iraq. We supported this animal, <laughs> this tyrant that was Saddam Hussein. Now, the truth is, the truth is, the military industrial complex of America armed Iran as well. Yes. Because they don't give a toss who they sell weapons to as long as they make money. But the Western world supported Saddam Hussein, who then became all. Oh, He's getting too big for his boots. We'll need to do him in. Uh, lots of oil there. We need to get him out of the way. He's talking about linking up with Gaddafi. He's talking about friendlier relations with Russia and China. We need to get him out of the way. Aye. Let's do him in. And that's what that was a manufactured war. But there's an example of somebody we supported, and then it's somebody that we've noticed support. What happened in 79, 78? Afghanistan. Missy Thatcher. The Mujahideen, who were supported by Britain and America to stop the Russian invaders. <laughs> now, I know. at that time, people go back and check it for yourselves. Afghanistan was an emerging democracy where they actually had quite a good human rights record. Um, women's rights was actually high up their agenda. Then the Mujahideen comes along and they're saying, no, actually, uh, we think there should be a religious-based state. We think that religion should be the way that we run our affairs. Women have to accept that they're no equal. Aye. And Russia invaded against that. Now, it was an unwise decision because the, uh, it, was Laden, a, it, was a, it was a sprawling state. But Bin Laden was the leader of the right. Mujahideen. The CIA trained them. The CIA right. funded them. Thatcher called them heroes. Right. Some years later, oh, now we have to be against Bin Laden. Right? It, it, there's a pattern emerging, isn't there? Yes. Whereby it's not about principles and values. It's about expedience. Who's best for our interests of profit and money We'll back them until they're not interested any longer and then we'll know back them. And what we'll do is we'll uh, kid everybody else on, we'll throw a lot of propaganda at them and get them to change their minds yes. so that so that they can back up what we're doing. And in many respects, Sean, I appeal to people, please, please, please don't forget the Coden Powell videos of, oh, here's the conclusive proof of weapons of mass destruction that we now know was a pile of shit, right? <laughs> you know, uh, very, very clever bullshit is still bullshit, right? <laughs> Just because it's clever and said by a, a black American who where everybody thinks, well, that's great, he's, he's black and he's American, look how high up he's got in the military <laughs> and all the rest of it. If he's telling us it must be true, no, it wasn't true, it was shit. <sighs> and what we have to therefore say... If that was the type of shit that we were getting told in 2003 to justify an invasion which led to a million people getting massacred, what do we think we're getting fed now when we're getting told that Hamas have got a base under the Al Shaif hospital in Gaza? What, what do we think we're getting told when we're saying, oh, aye, we need to turn off the incubators because, you know, underneath the incubators there's Kalashnikovs hiding. It is a pile of bullshit, very, very heartless, cruel, rancid bullshit that is made to make the rest of the world think, aye, it's okay to turn off the water and starve a whole population of 2.3 million people. Aye, it looks like genocide, but it's no really genocide because it's collective punishment, because they're all Hamas. I know, it's nuts. I, I, honestly, uh, Sean, it, 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 it's just history of the itself, and I'll, I'll be 60 next March, and it's it's the worst episode of my life, mate. I, Aye. You've witnessed... Uh, we've witnessed together the invasions of, of, of Afghanistan, of Iraq. We, we've saw some horrible, horrible situations. In terms of absolute depravity, what's happening in Palestine you now, I think, tops a lot. I just, I, 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 it just and makes for me weep. For a group of people, I mean, one of my favourite human beings, Tommy, is Gabba Matty. I absolutely love him. And, um, and I've take my hat off and I really, really, I'm so proud of all the Jewish people that have been out marching, um, all the Jewish people have showed support like for Gaza. Um, but the truth is, is you, 
when you say that you support Palestine does not mean that you support Hamas. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even mean that you're saying, I support terrorism. It doesn't even mean anything like that. You're supporting humanity. You're supporting people, babies, mothers, children who are sitting there in their houses just like us <clears throat> and they're getting blew up for nothing. Um, for our Israel who, I mean, it's you, 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 you cannot start at the Mossad, you can't, I mean, the, the whole way this has started, and I don't know how you feel about it, Tommy, but I just do not believe for a minute that the Israeli government allowed Hamas to come into that, that to come into Israel, like that border, there was no way they could pass that border in the first, that's my opinion. Um, it was manufactured again so that they could do this. Um, and I think that the way that you come out and you're anti-Semitic, if you say it, is to make you scared to say anything about it. It's yeah. to make you go, oh, well, I can't say anything because I'll be anti-Semitic. When you're not, you're supporting human beings who are getting blew up for nothing. And it's cluster bombs. It's 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 horrible, horror. it's violence. That I, I've been, I was in prison for 15 years and it's violence that you cannot comprehend. Um, so I don't know how you feel about that, Tommy, but that's my position on that. Sean, at the end of, end of the day, people who are very, very powerful, the Israeli lobby, very, very powerfully backed by America, they have a history. Who, who did Israel support during the Rhodesian crisis? They supported Rhodesia. They, they supported the murder and the persecution of blacks. Who did they support during apartheid? They supported South Africa. They, they armed the apartheid state. Who did, who did they support in Chile? They supported... Pinochet and uh, the murder of ordinary people in Chile. Israel has a track record of being a racist, right-wing, horrible regime. That means that we shouldn't be surprised that what they are doing now is genocide. Genocide in any definition of the term is genocide. And I'm not even going to get embroiled in the whole issue of whether... Uh, it's justified to attack because they were attacked. Because see, when you illegally occupy somebody, you no longer have the right to use that collective response argument. You no longer have the right to do it because you're already in the wrong. You're illegally occupying somebody else's land. Yes. Anything, the whole basis of international law says clearly that any people have the inert right to defend themselves. So whatever people do who are occupied, they've got the right to do it because they're occupied. And that, that's what we have to try and go over here, that there isn't a fair, itchy-peachy approach here. We're talking about a country that has brutally occupied another country for over 50 years and has assassinated. I heard a, a term, it was normal, Norman Finkelstein, anybody that's interested in the history of Israel-Palestine, go and uh, press the name Norman Finkelstein on YouTube and listen to what he's got to say. His mother and father were survivors of Auschwitz uh, concentration camp, where they, they, they were veterans of the ghetto uprising in Poland. All of his aunts and uncles were killed in concentration camps. This is a guy who's spent 40 years of his life studying um, and discussing uh, Israel-Palestine. And he makes the point about how every few years the Israeli government carry out an exercise which they call mowing the lawn. Mowing I the lawn. Heard that. And what it is, is they'll invade... They'll kill hundreds and hundreds of children just to keep people in line, just to let them know who's the boss. Go and, go and you know, anybody right. who's interested, go and, go and listen to it. And he makes the point. Norman Finkelstein makes the point. Is this a point. Jewish person? Obviously, He's probably, Jewish I, I... himself. And he makes the point that no longer is he going to be blackmailed by those who use the Holocaust, abuse the memory of the Holocaust, to justify in any way, shape, or form the genocide that Israel's carrying out. What he says is, to those who want to cry and weep 
about the memory of the Holocaust is cry and weep about the blood of the Palestinian children that's been spilled today. That's what they should do to remember the victims of the Holocaust, to remember those that struggled against what happened to them during that period. And his argument is, if you look at the demonstration recently in Central Station in, in New York, if you look at the Statue of Liberty demonstration, organised by young Jews. That's amazing. Young Jews amazing. who are fed up of their name being abused. Being against Israel is not being against Jews. Yes. Being against Israel is being human. <laughs> That's what it is. It's being human. You know, expressing solidarity and sympathy with and for Palestine does not make you anti-Semitic. It makes you a human being. Yes. That's what it does. And from my point of view, Sean, I think as Israel may believe because of their Western backers that they've won a great victory here. You know, the other day they're going and putting a flag above a bloody hospital. You know, it's trying to replicate what the Russians did in Berlin when they seriously defeated fascists. Right. When they turned a war, that they, they, they looked as though they had no chance of winning and actually won it. They had the right and the honour to go and put a red flag in, in above the Berlin Reichstag to show that they'd won. Yeah. These bastards there in a hospital. <laughs> Fucking cowards that they are. Absolute cowards. And yet we in the West are supposed to be supporting that. No. The world, the people of the world are with Palestine. The governments yeah. of the world may be with Israel, but the People of the world are with Palestine. And the interesting thing, Sean, is it's beginning to turn, mate. They think they've won a victory. What they've done is they've more isolated themselves than ever in the history of the Israeli state. Since 1948, I think they're more isolated now yes. and more exposed now as the tyrannical, bloodthirsty regime that they are. They're, they're minister, I think they're it's why they've manufactured Cameron to come back. I think that's manufactured because... Braverman makes a crazy statement that no Home Secretary would, would ever make. She gets put out, and all of a sudden, somebody who can't be questioned in the House of Parliament, which I was shocked to, because he's a lord, he doesn't need to answer to anybody. He now doesn't move into Home Secretary, moves into Foreign Secretary. Um, and it's because they needed a big boy in there. Because it's start, as you say, I think they're recognizing that normal people are saying, look, we don't want war anymore. Stop it. The military industrial comp what is what is that? People Halley button, what is we'll blow up your country and then we'll go and fix it up for you. Like it's obscene. It's it's to an extent where it, people really need to look into like the Kalil group, Halley Button, and all these exactly. these big, massive, massive corporations that nobody's even heard of. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think what you're saying, Tom, is right. I just, I th just be, think about children and think about just, I mean, look at, see if you're a child killer in jail, you get fucking terrorised. You There is no, no, um, just, no justifying, no sorrow for you. You're, you're we are. We are sending working class boys to do this and all, and it's coming, they're coming back destroyed. Absolutely. And then we go, we, they just leave them as well. I mean, I, I've seen it so much, Tommy, with guys going, coming back for these places in Iraq and that, and they're like, I don't know what we were doing, man. We were there, there and we were just told to secure oil fields and all that straight away. And these are working class boys, so they're looking these, no reason to like you. Absolutely. Um, we were told to secure oil fields. And you're like, and, and you're saying, why is like, I like, and then, and then, so imagine you're that young boy at 19 year old and you think you're patriotic and you think you're, and you blow, and then you find out what's happening. You grow up, you become more aware, you, you, you just become more socially kind of mindful of what's going on and you realize what you've done. It's no. crushing working class boys as well. You, I can guarantee there'll be no fucking, there'll be no. No boys from old guy and Jordan Hill and all that in these places. Do you know Absolutely. what I mean? Um, Absolutely. No. It's, a, it's like you 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 mentioned the the word terrorism earlier when you were talking there, and I always recall the the statement made in relation to the Irish struggle, and the word terrorist 
depends on what end of the gun you're on. Che Guevara and you know what I mean? <laughs> one man, you know, one man's, one man's uh, terrorist, and all a man's yes. freedom fighter. And and uh, I just I'm not going to take a position. People used to condemn the you thought you're called Nelson Mandela a terrorist. I know, right? The NC were terrorists, and I used to make the point when I was campaigning against apartheid. Imagine we were living in Soweto, and we were young working class kids, and we were witnessing the South African Defence Force coming in and, and murdering our parents and our cousins and our aunties and our uncles. Would you pick up a gun? Or no. would you pick up more more probably would you pick up a piece of fucking petrol in a bottle and, and light it with a bit of rag because they didn't have guns, no. right? And would you then be called a terrorist because you picked up to try and defend your what so for me terrorism amazing like is, 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 a, is, is a pejorative term. It was made up by the CIA. Absolutely. It's, 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 absolutely. A, it's a manufactured word. Um, and I think when you go in and you start looking at, uh, I mean, I've been doing the rabbit hole, Tommy, right? And I, I've just, like, you, you're trying to learn and you're trying, I mean, um, and what I just came to the conclusion is, is they fucking win every time. Hmm. They, do not, they do not care what happens. And I don't know if governments even know, I don't know if they know, I think people, David Cameron and that definitely know that they're in a position, but I think a lot of them, and I are probably going to university and studying what they believe is happening when it's really no, it's something else. There's a, there's there's, a, there's bigger powers at play. Um, and when I went down, just go down and you're like, just follow the money. I always remember follow the money, and you you it's just going always it's always going by the same place, and you're like, really, man, like Saudi Arabia and all that, and at these places now. Look at that Tyson Fury and Ganu thing. Did you see this? That was like a big show, and you're like. What what's happening here? Like I don't know. What, like are we not supposed to? What, there's all this stuff in the Middle East. Why is this? Why are they no bothering about it? And you just need. To, I don't know. It's it's so. Um, it's hypocrisy, mate. It's so it's just, I. hypocrisy runs through Western um, so-called uh, international politics. Uh, it's like a stick of rock. It's just, it's just pure naked hypocrisy. And what what is happening? I think. Um, there's an interesting development vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations now because you've got the G7 countries, which is the big powerful fuckers, you know, the, the UK, uh, Germany, France, US. But you've got another group called the G77, and that's the rest of the world. It's the, the Latin American, the Central America, the African nations. And what people now have to realise is they are absolutely contrary to all the positions that the G7 have adopted. Right. So the rest of the world is now looking at the neo-colonial imperialist past of the West and saying, fuck off. We're not, we're not fed, we're fed up with your right. values now. Definitely. We're not accepting that you are going to impose on us your order when it's full of holes. You only apply international law when it applies to somebody else. <laughs> you don't apply international law to yourselves. <laughs> if you applied international law to yourselves, Israel wouldn't be supported. It would be boycotted. It would be isolated. It would be expelled from all sorts of international bodies. It would be the pariah that it actually is. But America says it's all right, so, oh, no, no, we, we don't do that because we're frightened of America. Loads of countries now saying they're not, they're not frightened of America, which is why, might not have time to go into in, in detail, but it's why the whole Ukraine conflict, Sean, is full of complexity. Well, we just found out and, that Ukraine and, blew up the, the pipe, didn't they? <laughs> well, it certainly looks like that anyway. Well, like, Sean, um, Sean, who, who on earth, who on earth would doubt that Russia, <laughs> with the billions of pounds that they've spent in building the Nord Stream pipeline, with the amount of uh, money that would be gained by the, the transfer, the export of gas through those pipelines, that they blow up their own pipeline. That's <laughs> fucking insane that people would even believe the, that you would say that. Of course Ukraine did it, but they didn't do it on their own. They did it with the support of America, and then they blame Russia. And what I'm that saying, in power. and what I'm saying is, that if if that's happening with something like that, then how many other things is it happening with? The mo d please, please, anybody that's watching this podcast, don't accept what the Western media is telling you. You listen to what they're saying, and then you say, why? Why are they saying that? Why are they telling me that? Who's benefiting from this? 
I'm going to go investigate it. You mentioned Oliver Stone earlier. Go and watch Oliver Stone's documentary on 2014 Ukraine and the coup that America engineered and financed to overthrow the elected Prime Minister of Ukraine to put in a puppet American uh, 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 um, uh, statement, statesman. They did that. Why? Because they wanted to expand NATO. They wanted to put weapons right on uh, uh, Russia's uh, doorstep. Now, if that had been Mexico, if that had been Cuba, mm -hmm. we saw what America would do. Mm -hmm. America would be like, that'll be right. We're going to blow you out of the water. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And that was a president who was they, quite... They did that liberal. to Ukraine. What did they expect that, uh, that Russia was going to do? Just sit back and say, I no problem when you come by. Bring in your nuclear weapons and all that. Madness. Russia's done I know. what any other country defending their own security would have done. After eight years, people think, oh, uh, the Ukraine war started last February. No, it didn't. The Ukraine war started in 2014. 14,000 people have been killed in, in the uh, Donbass region of Ukraine, the Russian-speaking region of Ukraine. Ukraine have done that. So this war's been going on for many, many years. People think, oh, it's, it's just happened last year. No, it's not. It's bullshit that you're being fed. Right. So please don't accept the bullshit. No, you're right. Um, I think, obviously, I mean, I'm not a big, massive fan of Putin myself, but I, I, I understand coming from his background and coming from what he believes in that, um, and he, I've watched him recently and I would say to anybody as well, Tommy, to go and watch what he actually says. He doesn't want a war. He really is kind of pleading. So he talks look, more sense than any of the Western leaders put that way. I, I agree with you. Um, agree all, 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 with you. Again, more truthful. I mean, he's, you, he's a, you, you can understand why I, I was so happy that you mentioned Oliver Stone's name earlier because Oliver Stone did a series of interviews with Putin. The Putin aye. interviews, they called it. And Jesus, does that reveal a lot? You aye. know, and Putin, Stone isn't he a big apologist, a uh, promoter of Putin in any shape aye. or form. But what he does do is he humanises him and he, he gives you his background and where he came from. Aye. And his perspective on what the West has been doing, encircling Russia, encircling China, and yet they're the aggressors. I know. It's it's just, it, it, it defies logic that you would accept that. I know. And we fight under a veil of democracy and we tell people's democracy. We're, we're not in a democracy. We're in a, um, go to Poso. I would go and stand in Poso for a night and see for how democratic we are. Go and stand in your working class schemes. Mm -hmm. See how long you last standing on a street corner. Um, or go into, I mean, I've got any, I, I, my family are off of Black Hill, Rikese and stuff like that. And I'm no for affluent background myself. Do you know what I mean? I'm for Cumberland. But, uh, what you need to do is look at society and it's like, look at some great philosophers like Dostoevsky, people that say, look at the bottom of society to see how your society is actually around. Yeah. Why, I mean, Joe Rogan, I watched him the other night and he was saying that there's, he believes that there's people where there's trillionaires, uh, possibly in Saudi Arabia. Now, what the fuck do you need a trillion pound in your bank account for when there's so much poverty. I mean, what is happening, Tommy? Do you know what I mean? Like, why? Just, uh, the world is fucked, um, Sean. There's no doubt about it. But we all live in it. Um, and I, I suppose my appeal to people is not to lose faith, not to lose hope. Because uh, as soon as you... That candle of hope that burns in your heart, as soon as that's extinguished, then you become cold and cruel and callous. Don't burn that candle of hope. Try as best you can, whether it's in a trade union, whether it's in a community group, whether it's in a, a campaign. Uh, there's so many interesting campaigns out there, just social justice campaigns. I encourage people, look, get involved. No, you can't support everything. You can't, no. you, you're only a person. You can't divide yourself up and all the rest of it. But do something. Do something, you know, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember I, I remember reading that uh, fantastic the phrase, uh, uh, I, on on my own, I can't change anything, said 8 billion people. <laughs> you know, and that, that's what it says, isn't it? Because Aye. we all think we're on our own. And it's when we come together that the, the ruling class and the ruling order get worried. There's so um, much more of us. And I, I, I always look at it and I go, why is the Tories in power? How are they getting? I mean, this is people who... Whether she say that manufactured or no, this is people who are saying homeless people are ruining our cities. This is people with that, that's the belief system that yep. these people have got. Jacob Rees-Mogg, 
walking about that we just look at them just look, just look at them and that's the people who are telling you i've no what i don't know any working class people i've never met a working class person mm -hmm. in my life that the parliament that we've got is just and then you look at scottish politics i mean we'll maybe take it on to scottish politics and now tommy um and talk about what's the state i mean when I was younger, I probably wasn't for independence, right? And the reason the reason I wasn't and and is because I didn't believe that we'd be able to go and uh, with an army. Uh, I didn't believe we, we, we would go, we'd be able to hang with the pound. The older I've got, I'm starting to go like we could. Why do we need an army? We don't need an army. Let's we could be people. We could be a country that starts and, and kind of trailblazes and goes. You don't need an army. Do you not know I mean why do we need an army? Let's. We don't need war at all. Um, so I'm starting to, like, and I'm obviously listening to people like yourself, George Galloway, people like, oh, and obviously I like, see, to be honest, Nicola Sturgeon was actually, I actually quite liked her. And I thought, I did not expect that for her. I did not expect that, Tommy. So maybe you can give us a wee bit more insight to that. Sean, I, I, my background's probably similar to yours in that respect, because when I told you earlier about joining the, the Labour Club at the age of 17, I was uh, very much a socialist, um, very much a Tony Benn advocate. Uh, at least I had him. John McLean was he? Well, uh, he, he came later um, in terms of my university because then um, my mum had encouraged me to read the Nan Milton book um, on John McLean, which I did do, and then that started to whet my appetite. And what I was taught in my political circles in those days was um, John McLean's support for a, an independent Scottish Republic was premature. John McLean thought that the Scottish working class were more advanced than the English working class, and that's why he supported an independent republic. But if John McLean had lived a bit longer, then he would have witnessed the general strike of 1926, because McLean died in 1923, um, and he would have changed his views. And I used to, I listen, I was young, I used to listen to that and think, oh, right, oh, is that, is that right? And then the older I got and more I read about it, I realised it's bullshit. John, John McLean was right. Scotland is different. Scotland has its own national identity. Scotland's values, its principles are different because we're of a different nation. We yeah. are a different nation. You've just mentioned Rhys Mogg. You could mention <laughs> Boris Johnson. You could <laughs> me mention Suala Braverman. These bastards were all elected in England. Aye. We've we've not elected. Scotland hasn't elected a Tory government since 1951. 1951. Let that thing in. England has. Mm. How how could they do that? How how could they London vote? has me How could it? they vote for these people? I know. I just can't, I, I, I know. cannot conceive of it, Sean. How they can vote for no. Boris Johnson? He's a prick. <laughs> how the hell can you vote for that absolute prick? And yet they vote for him. I know. I look at it. We all laugh at it. I remember oh, during. You, so you I says, remember you, during the, the 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 referendum campaign, being accused of scaremongering because I made the point. People are all looking for definites, right? You can't guarantee Scotland will be a better place and independence. You can't guarantee that we'll keep the pensions. You can't guarantee this, that, and the next thing. And I said, you're absolutely right. I'm, I can't guarantee anything. What I can guarantee is if we stay in the union, we're going to get worse and worse and worse because the Tories will get re-elected and you'll get right-wing nitwits like uh, Johnson get elected. Oh, yeah, that's scary. That will never happen. That will never happen. And I said, and we'll get dragged out the European Union, that'll never happen. Everything we said would happen it's has happened. happened. <laughs> you know, and, and yet we were the scaremongers. Uh, and from my point of view, Sean, I um, probably run about 80, 89, um, 90 was when I began to say to myself, no, listen, we actually need, we need an independence. Need so I, I don't think anybody um, of our ilk should in any way, shape or form be ashamed of, of our backgrounds and believing. I believed in British socialism Aye. for a, the first same. part of my life, right? I, I thought the likes of Tony Benn could lead Britain to become a socialist country. Aye. And now I understand how um When the gaslit Corbyn, I was. When the gaslit Corbyn, 
uh, that was a big eye opener for me and done the anti Semitic him uh, um, that was a that was um a turning point for me and going that's no that that was then no, it's no fair. There's no a fair playing Absolutely. ground here. Um so now on you go, Tommy, sorry for putting that No, there. all I was gonna say is that I then realised um in terms of my application to history across the world and my absolute support for Cuba and the fight for national determination, the fight against imperialism, the fight to keep America out, my support for Venezuela and the Bolivarian revolution. Um, the reason now in 2003 I wanted to interview Chavez um, was because I wanted to ask him, was it a socialist revolution or was it a nationalist revolution? Because some people philosophically were saying, oh, and it's nothing to do with socialism, it's nationalism. And, and I'm saying to myself, well, everything they're doing is, is for the working class. Definitely. It's about dis redistributing wealth. It's the type of things I think socialism's all about. Um, but what I did do is I get, get a chance. I never interviewed um, Chavez, but I in interviewed uh, Jose uh, Vicente Rangel, who was his foreign minister. Um, and uh, which, what a privilege to be guy for Scott, be guy for Paul, <laughs> get the, sit in the presidential palace and shake hands with Jose Vicente Rangel. Um, it was surreal, um, but sat across the table for uh, Jose Vicente Rangel and I put the question to him, I said, um, in your opinion, um, is your government um, a socialist government or is it a nationalist government back home? People are asking, uh, is socialism your goal um, or, or or is it the Bolivarian Republic um, um, in, in the name of Simon Bolivar, who is a nationalist uh, icon for them? And uh, he said to me, he said, well, first of all, uh, I have to say um, this is the first government in my lifetime and I'm 76 who hasn't imprisoned me so, so, so I have to take my hat off. <laughs> and it turns out he was the founder of the Young Communist League in Venezuela. Wow. And throughout Aye. his whole life, he campaigned for socialism and campaigned against corruption and for just social justice. Had been jailed by every government that he'd lived under uh, and knew he was a foreign minister, you know. Aye. And uh, quite clear to me, it was a socialist revolution. There's no doubt about it. And Nicolas Maduro... All of us now, don't certainly make sure of that. Oh, listen, he's definitely... Socialist. Maduro, bus driver, Aye. bus driver, now president. Uh, to me, what these bastards tried to do um, when they uh, recognised this Guido uh, character and they tried to put him in, the European Union announced, we recognise Guido as the legitimate uh, prime minister of Venezuela. The prick had even stood in the presidential election and they're, they're, they're holding up posters saying they recognise him. How out of the world in terms of democracy can you get when they're, they're promoting somebody that never even stood in the election because they didn't accept that the election was fair. The Jimmy Carter Foundation in America said it was the fairest election in the whole of South and Latin America. So of course, <laughs> Venezuela is a legitimate socialist government, but it doesn't no, fit the narrative. So they have to try it and, and do it. And from my point of view, Sean, here in, here in Scotland, uh, I think even referring to Britain as a country reflects a lack of historical understanding mm -hmm. because Britain isn't a country, Britain's no. a construct. Aye. That, that it isn't a unified one nation. It is four nations and even that is... It is, used to is, be fucking colonialism. It used to be how many well, nations? Do you know what I mean? They, they, used, to, they right. used to say that the reason um, uh, Britain did all its uh, work in, in the dark is because the light never ever shed uh, the, uh, on, the, on the whole uh, existence of our colonial uh, rule because two thirds of the world at one time was under Britain's uh, yoke. Um, and if you think of what what they did in Ireland. I mean, the idea that Ireland is anything but for the Irish, you know, yeah. the it, it's going to be inevitable. And people will say, oh, people in the North of Ireland say, oh, I want to stay British. Fine, mate, you should move to England then because that island of Ireland is Ireland. That's, that's what it is. And, and it, it may take a while, but it's inevitable. It's coming. It's going to be Ireland. Uh, I think similarly, Scotland will be Scotland. I, I, I think, Sean, you cannot rule out the weight of support among the young people Aye. to be independent. To, and by the way, to, I don't even think they would, they would view it like that. I think the way it says, we want to be normal. 
Because independence is normal. Aye. Scotland is not. Being Scotland and being Scottish is normal to young Scots. Aye. When I grew up, you grew up, you didn't have a Scottish parliament. No. You, you, didn't, you didn't go and visit the Scottish parliament. You didn't have a parliament passing laws that were about Scotland. No. Youngsters now are all growing up in a, in a, 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 a country. A different world. I, I had a parliament. It's got its own identity. It's own parliament. Mm -hmm. And that's why, if you look at the the demographics of the referendum in 2014, over 70% of under 30 year olds voted for independence. Over 70%. What are they going to do when we come 40 and 50? They're not going to say, no. oh, I used to support independence, but now I don't want it. Now I want to stay with, uh, with Rishi Shunak because uh, he's, he's a bee's knees, you know. <laughs> Or, or Starmer, you know. Aye. Oh, Sir, Sir, Sir Keir Starmer, he's, he's going to save the world, you know. A fucking rat. <laughs> an absolute rat of an individual. You know, done in Corbyn, uh, stands for leadership. Oh, I'm going to keep all of those 10 principles, then does in every one of the principles, then does in Corbyn, then does in everybody else. And he is a rat of the highest order. And that's what the British Union's got to offer I know. for Scotland. I know. Come on. I sometimes, Sean, I really do sometimes get fed up with some people, not all, but I sometimes say when people say, oh, but can you guarantee this? Can you guarantee that? I say, no, I can't guarantee fuck all. But I can tell you, if you want to continue with this rat race, then you continue with it. Right. I think that it's impossible that people in Scotland running their own affairs could do it any worse than what they're doing. I, I just, know, I I just don't think it's possible to do it any right. worse. I think, um, to be honest, I think my views were probably biased. I was 19 when I went into prison, Tommy. Obviously done a long time, done 15 years in the jail. Um, and I think I was biased in thinking that when I did, I studied law and I studied and I seen like the judiciary was a massive pillar of society. It was one of the kind of, um, the three, whatever you call it, I can't remember the three, um, the foundations or whatever. But I think... I probably got that mixed up a wee bit. We're going, I hate the fucking, I hate the courts, I hate the ju judicial system. Um, I probably was that as well when I was younger. Um, so there's a lot of things that I've changed my views on. And what I, age were you, Sean? 19. 19, right. So, so, so you're a young man. I, I was really young and I was I was getting that. I was, start, I was starting to read, like, and I was re reading about the Bilderberg, reading about this and reading about that. And I was just like, I didn't, it was a mere globalist thing. I was, I was so when I was, just didn't really look, but now that I'm starting to go, no, these people um, are so no like us, and I, I'm so disappointed in Nicola Sturgeon in many ways because I gave her the benefit of the doubt. I'm not a fan of the Sean, I, 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 I share your disappointment, mate. I, I am on record uh, in 2015 after the, the uh, referendum. I, I went out my way. By the way, I lost a lot of political support from within my own party at the time. I was a leader of Solidarity at the time. And I called for people to vote SNP in 2015 Aye. election. Um, I The way I couched it was lend your vote to Aye. the SNP. What I'd done is I'd learned the lesson of 2014. What did the unionists do in 2014? They united. Mm -hmm. they, they, they united together yes. to try and crush the dream of independence. So I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. See if we unite. Mm -hmm. In 2015 at the general election, we could crush them ele 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 electorally. Aye. 56 MPs we won. Aye. 56 out of 50. I mean, that should have been the time when they turned around. I mean, Thatcher, for many, many years, had used to always say in Parliament, uh, if the Scots want their independence, all they need to do is send a majority of MPs to this Parliament. That's all they have to do. Fucking 56 out of 59, you know. Aye. Every single election since then, we've done it. But the truth is, I thought to Nicola um, and others had more backbone. I thought they had more gumption and courage. Um, and What do you make of the salmon thing? I think salmon, unfortunately, has been done in, mate. I, I, I believe I, that I'm as well. No? I, I've read as much as I can, um, and it's clear to me that the guy's been set up. I think um, that. They have seen him as a potential fly in the ointment. Um, Alec and I... I've got differences of opinion politics. I'm a socialist. Alec isn't he a socialist? Mm. He's a social democrat. But do I believe he wants independence for Scotland? Absolutely. Aye. Absolutely. Hundred percent. Do I believe that Nicola wants independence for Scotland? I'm not so sure any longer. Aye. Do I believe that Swinney and the others? I'm sorry. I believe that the SNP leadership now has become far too comfortable with the um, chains of 
government, the mm. ministerial cars, the nice pensions, the ability to employ family and friends, the trappings of power. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember campaigning with the SNP in 15 and saying, we're sending you down there uh, to settle up, not to settle down, aye, right? Aye. Problem is, far too many of them have settled down. I, 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 I'm I, listening to stories about them all fighting to get on committees and I'm saying, what are you doing on a committee? Take fucking jelly night down there and blow the place <laughs> up, you know, where's, where's the Guido Fox attitude? Uh, you, you're not there to make the Westminster work, you're there to get us out here. Uh, and they forgot about it, mate. They, uh, they, they want to be part of the system, they, they want to be uh, mainstream. Uh, I'm sorry, mainstream is staying part of the British Union. That's not going to get you, uh, it's not going to cut it, it's not going to get you the independence. So, I worry. Uh, politically shown that we're a bit lost just now in the independence movement. You've got the Alba party been formed, Salmon's uh, at the head of it, the good people like Kenny McCaskill, Neil Hanvey, lots of others are involved with it. Uh, I'm a supporter and member of that party and I'll, I'll campaign for it because as a socialist, some people would criticise me and with justification, I, listen, some criticisms you've just got to roll with. You just, it's not always People are allowed their opinion, aren't they? They're allowed their opinion, and some people would say, but Tom, you're a socialist, you should support a socialist party. Aye. Right? Um, we deliberately decided to um, de-register the Socialist Party Solidarity because we were supporting ALBA. Because my opinion is socialism is going to be delivered via independence. I don't think we're going to get socialism without independence, Sean. Aye. So therefore, my priority is independence. Aye, of course. Right? Once we've got an independent Scotland, I think we then fight for an independent socialist Scotland. Some people would say, ah, but you're, you shouldn't be separating them, you shouldn't be postponing in, uh, socialism. And I just say, look, my but world, with my the Tories, real world. It's, socialism is never no, happening, is it? So no. you can, you can well, like. It's never mind never, the Tories. No. Is it going to happen with Keir Starmer? No. no. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, so <laughs> that the, the route to socialism is not via Britain. The route to socialism is via breaking the British state. I mean, right. I, 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 I couldn't understand why anybody with a an Irish background say, I can understand my mate, a lot of my mates been brought up in loyalist backgrounds, right? And the Queen and the Crown, and it's been part of their lives. I, I think it's a pile of shite. Same. But the, the, I can understand, understand where they're coming totally, back to, right? I totally understand it, aye. But see anybody who's came up via an Irish background that doesn't support Scottish independence, I can't understand it. Aye. Because our whole ancestry is about breaking the British Crown. Breaking the, anything that weakens the British Crown's got to be good for the working class. Aye. And yet they're only supporting independence. Some of them. Uh, I used to go to some of the Irish uh, Republican pubs and things like that. And people, some of it was to do with the Celtic board, you know, or the millionaire Tories on the board. Oh no, we're against independence. Brian Wilson, uh, Nicholson, uh, your man Desmond. Oh, we're again in, against independence. Of course they're against independence because it's about changing the social order. They had billions of pounds. Their, 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 their millionaire status might come into question. You know, I, I used to make a point um, in relation to my campaign for in independence that the only, because they used to say, oh, the, the Royal Bank of Scotland is saying it's going to leave. And I said, the only <laughs> banks that are going to be closing in an independent Scotland are food banks. Aye. That's the only banks that will be closing because we don't need food banks because we'll actually be giving people enough money they can buy their own food. Yes. You know, and, and restore some dignity instead of having the absolute... The uh, atrocity of nurses and other public sector workers being so poor they're having to go to fucking food banks. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's an atrocity in the 21st century, uh, Sean. I just, I hate it. And a country with our wealth and our status, we have natural resources, our land, our oil, our water, our intelligence, our universities. And we've got thousands going to food banks. I know. <laughs> It's ridiculous. No, it's a, and I think um, I had. To, I don't. I think he's a friend. Just Chris Dolan. Yeah. Chris was on here, um, and we had a, a great conversation. And we were talking about a maximum wage, um, the same as a minimum wage. And I was saying, do you know what? I see people that are good at something, and see people that are good, like. I says I don't like say don't have that life that you deserve. Like going and people might have that. 
I said, but see if you can, see if you want to cap it even like a 50 million or something and say, you're not allowed any more than that. Any more than that, you're like, it's all going into society. If you can't live a 50 million or something around me. I remember doing a show show and I can't remember, what was the name of it? It was an STV show when I were up with Aberdeen to, uh, to, to, to record it. Um, and it was it was a show where you, you did an argument, you put an argument and then you have a debate and then you discuss after the debate whether anybody's changed their mind, right? I can't remember what it was called. Anyway, uh, my my argument was that we should have a maximum wage as well as a minimum wage. Um, and my argument was that even if you set it to begin with, it's something like 10 to 1. Aye. Well, if somebody's getting a minimum wage of, say, £15 an hour, and somebody else is getting £150 an hour, are we seriously suggesting that the person £150 an hour can't live? <laughs> can't <laughs> can have niceties, can't have a, a lovely house and a nice couple of cars and go on holidays? £150 an hour? Right. Come on. But what you do is you begin to value everyone in society. Instead of what we've got the new where carers are having to strike to get £12 an hour, I know. right? Carers who do the job that nobody else wants to do, but without them, we wouldn't be able to survive as a society, and they're struggling to get £12 an hour, while bankers and stockbrokers are getting £12 million an hour. No. Our world is upside down, Sean that we recognise and give money to people who produce fuck all in society, who move money run about stocks and shares, produces nothing. You, you, that financial times index, oh, the index went up three points today. What does it mean? It means fuck all to anybody other than that they've made money because they've moved stocks and shares. They've not produced a single train or a bus or, or a bread. A or, product, they've, they've produced fuck all, but they've moved money around about and they've made money out of it. But carers are getting in to grandmothers and aunties and uncles and caring for them and taking them to the toilet and feeding them, washing them, doing jobs that are essential and getting paid fucking buns. I know. I, to me, that's what that's what makes me a socialist, Sean. I want right. to change that. John McLean went to society, he went to court in, in the High Court in Edinburgh, 2018, and he was accused of sedition. That's why he got put in the jail for, and he done his own defence. And the judge said to him uh, that he was a, a seditious character because he, he supported socialism and he wanted the overthrow of society. And he said, oh no, my Lord, uh, what, what I have to say is, he said, and he put his on it. He says, here, is the working class and they're the vast majority and here is the, the ruling class and they're a minority. All I want is that, <laughs> is I want the majority to have the benefits of society. That's all I want, my Lord. And they, get, uh, they gave him five years. <laughs> he served 18 months yet. Uh, but anyway, uh, to put me Peter Heed. But the, 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 the point is, if you think society's fine, fair does. But, Except it. I mean, I, see if you don't. One percent. It's no even one percent, Tommy. It's like it's less than one percent on ninety nine percent of the wealth. Um, and I think when you start digging, even if you scratch the surface of, I don't know, whatever. Like, and I, I don't see Elon Musk and people. I don't. I actually don't know about him. Right. I, I, I think he's. I, I'm starting to lean towards that he's maybe. Um, I don't even know what the fuck, an alien or something, I don't know, but it's, it's, I'm starting to lean, I used to like him, but I'm starting to go, is he just one of them that's in there to kind of hang you? But he does talk about, he cryptically talks about things and, and the way the money's distributed and stuff, and I think buying Twitter and stuff like that was to kind of show, like, um, what what is this shit? Like, this is like um, social media, it's bullshit, as you say, it's like a... It's a free, pro it's like a product that's nothing, but it's worth billions and billions of pounds. And I, I use Twitter myself and I like it and it keeps you in contact. It's a good good product that way. But I mean, I just don't know like where the, how- John, John do you know the problem that you and I would have in terms of social media? Is see if he didn't have it. 
Aye. We wouldn't be talking about Oliver Stone now. We wouldn't be talking about Norman Finkelstein. We wouldn't be talking about some of the ideas that I doesn't know. get any air in the mainstream media. So for all of the negatives that go with social media, Massive there's loads of positives. Definitely. It's, to me, I, I sometimes describe it as a knife. Aye. Knife used wrongly can be fatal. Aye, yeah, right. But aye. a knife used properly can yes. help you spread the butter on your toast and it's very, very essential. And to me, social media is a forum within which you can have the generation of ideas that don't get any air, Aye. don't get any oxygen from the mainstream media. And to, in many respects, it's why the mainstream media hate it. Aye. It's why it's why the ruling class hate social media because social media is allowing, now it's very, very small, but it's allowing it's growing, that wee whimper Aye. of different ideas and different narratives to, to come out. You look at, if you were to turn on your BBC News at night uh, and over the last few weeks, you would be mistaken for thinking that the uh, Israel was supported by everybody for what they're doing. I know. And actually, if I go on social media and you will see that all across the world, millions are protesting and condemning them. And eventually the mainstream media has to articulate that Aye. because they know they have to be careful not to be called out to be the phonies that they are. They have to pretend Aye. sometimes. Oh, no, 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 we understand. We're being fair. We know they're not Aye. being fair because they set up the narrative. All of the time, the narrative is Israel's defending itself. Aye. Israel's defending. And, and they never say uh, Israel attacking Gaza. They say every Israel attacking Hamas. Aye. Immediately putting in people's Put minds. Out. You know, a lovely, lovely way to drop Aye. the idea in. Oh, I but they're not really attacking ordinary people. It's Hamas. Or the, Aye. You know, we have to be aware of that, Sean. I've said that before. I think that um, if you, Joseph Goebbels would be absolutely so proud of um, the way the West of uh, Turkey's uh, manufactured oh. propaganda and they uh, ran with you. They've took it to another level. Absolutely. Um, so, but I think when I'm talking about Elon Musk, like people Elon Musk, I can't make their mind up. I go, right, he's bought Twitter. He's starting to allow people to talk on it again because Twitter was shutting people down and stuff like that. Um, but this is where it confused. They get me. We can, they confuse me. We um, gain me too much. And I don't know where to make it, people. And I don't know where to place them. And I think that's where my problem lies. Where I go, when, on a globalist scale, I go, Right, where are we here? Like, and I'm trying to like kind of navigate myself about, and I go right. That, these powerful, powerful people, and I go, where is he? Where does he stand here? I d and I, I don't know if it's a. I think you have thing. to examine. Don't you have to examine their background, their history? You, you again. I'm sorry to mention his name again, but we talked about Oliver Stone earlier. Look at the consistency. Look, go back to his whole life and look about how everything he's done creatively through his artwork for him, he's in, in terms of his films, but then his documentaries and his, his writings. What has he ever tried to do but to scratch the veneer of lies to expose the truth? All he's ever tried to do is expose truth yes, and, sh I... and through that get a path to justice. And for me, that's what you've got to do with everybody. You, you, I, I've not looked into uh, Musk at all. Um, I, I, I tend to find... Has uh, use Saudi of his uh, well, you know, I, 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 I always, always get worried when I, I hear Saudi Arabia's involvement in anything because it is all about money, it's all about control, it's all about power. They get away with contravening the democratic equality rights for women in their own society, uh, and we condemn everybody else for that unless it's Saudi Arabia and we, we turn a blind eye. Why? Because they've got money. Oh, so that makes it right then, because they've got money. I know. So I always get suspicious of that. I, to, to me, we've got to base ourselves um, in, in the, the organisations of the working class. You look at the trade union movement, you, you look at trade union leaders and individuals and you say to yourself, what are they saying? Uh, why are they saying these things? What research have they done? And you you base your understanding and and your propaganda that you use you you take from there because you actually believe in it. Aye. The propaganda you're getting from others, I think most of it's manufactured. I, I don't think it has a substance of truth. Aye. No, I agree with you. And I, I think um, I th I some, that's what I say because Fiona, obviously, my missus, she'll go like that. Sean, I can't be bothered. She just wants to live in her wee. And I say that 
in a way that's the problem that we've got Cost and I, I don't mean I, I love Fiona but she and she, all she wants to look after my wee boy mm-hmm. and make sure I'm alright but she'll go Sean it's too much for me mm-hmm. like the, the stuff you're saying to me you're bursting my wee bubble like I just don't want to know about it I don't want to see it I don't and I'm like Fiona you need to we need to see it but I understand totally why the working class people are, are ground down, we're, we're, we're beaten down and we're in a stage where we need to watch our mortgage, we need to pay mm-hmm. for more, we need messages, you spoke yep. about food banks. Um, and also you're taught to be cynical and sceptical. So anybody that is saying something, um, you immediately try and bring them down. Um, you, John Pilger is another guy I've no mentioned. Um, but John Pilger... Born democracy. Just, it was born democracy. Uh, he's thing. he's, he's an absolutely fantastic investigative journalist who his uh, body of works um, con- constitutes an explanation of the world and, and people should delve into his body of works. And uh, he, he talked about in Heroes, one of his books, he, he talks about um, speaking to visitors from the Soviet Union uh, in those days as it was to the to the UK and uh, he, he talks about uh, how we at least don't have gulags we don't we don't lock people up for Aye. whose views are contrary to the the ruling views of society and the the guy responds by saying yeah you, you don't have gulags but you don't need them because <laughs> you crucify anybody Aye. that steps out of line and and and, and Pilger went on to say, yeah, you're allowed, it's like a boxing ring, you're allowed to trade blows on the level of inflation, the level of unemployment, Uh, we're going to increase uh, the interest rates by X percent, and you're allowed to have that debate within the boxing ring. But as soon as you say, actually, why are we doing all this? Why don't we just have a different social system where everything's owned and controlled by the people and the wealth of the people is used for everyone rather than for you? Oh, no, 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 that's not allowed. You get criticised, you get alienated, you get assaulted. You know, you, Tony Benn was a Libyan, uh, uh, Arthur Scargo, his mortgage paid. Galloway was a Russian. Yeah, you know, everybody who is a socialist, who argues for a different form of society, will be absolutely crucified by the media. There's no doubt about it. Why? Because the media is part of the ruling order. The media isn't interested in changing oh. because then you would question their power and their privilege. Anybody that questions power or privilege is going to be attacked. And if you're not willing to accept that, then you shouldn't question it. No. Um, so just, to, we're obviously coming to the end, Tommy. It's been absolutely brilliant having you on. Um, and just the one thing that I was just wanting to kind of just ask you was your wee experience on Big Brother, just on a wee bit of a lighter note. How did that come about? Um just to, obviously, because I was quite interested to know just how that came about. Absolutely, Paul. Uh, Big Brother, I was invited on to Big Brother in 2006. Um, I'd fought a court case against News of the World in 2006 um, and won uh, my court case. And uh, it was quite a high-profile court case, get covered by the British media instead of just the Scottish media. Uh, and a woman contacted us uh, for London to say that she was an agent that had worked with George Galloway and uh, she did, Big Brother wanted me to go on and I said, look, no way. I'm, going to Big Brother. I said, I'm, I'm in Parliament. Aye. No way I'm going to Big Brother. I've got a job. I'm, I'm, I'm not interested. Oh, but they'll pay a lot of money. I said, look, I'm not interested. Uh, I don't care how much I pay. I'm, I've got a job. And then in 2007, I lost my seat, unfortunately, uh, by 1% in Glasgow. Um, and I started doing a law degree. And in 2008, the uh, same woman contacted me to say, Big Brother, I want you gone again. Um, and I'd done a Edinburgh uh, show, the, what do you call the thing we do, the shows at Edinburgh? The uh, fringe, 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 fringe. I'd done a fringe show in Edinburgh, 22 nights, uh, talk show type of thing, where I'd invite guests on and, have a laugh and I'd take the piss because I had a big <laughs> sunbed on <laughs> on the, the the stage so it was like a bit of self-depreciation I, I don't mind taking the piss uh, sometimes that's what you've got to do um, don't, uh, don't be too precious um, and when the course of doing that um, I met another guy who'd invited this group of 
comedian on, um, after which this comedian said, oh, you'd be great in the jungle. And I thought she was meaning my head of chest. And she went, <laughs> oh, no, no, my sister's a casting director for uh, I'm a Celebrity. Um, I think you'd be great in that. And I says, oh, well, uh, speak to um, Nigel. His name is Nigel, the guy that done right. the uh, uh, booting company. Um, so the reason I say that is because there was a coalition of requests or a coalition of offers because I was invited on to, I went down to ITV studios and did an interview and all that stuff. And I get invited to do the, I'm a celebrity, but I also get invited to do the Big Brother. Big brother. Um, and both of them, the Big Brother thing started at 60 grand. And the woman said, I don't think that's enough. I'm going to argue for more. I was like, ah, 60 grand, fucks, eh? <laughs> um, and then she comes back and says, right, they've agreed 100 uh, 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 grand, uh, but I take 20%. Aye. So I'm getting 80 fucking thousand. I'm like, ah, what? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> for, I says, for three weeks? Because people sometimes say to me, Sean, why did you do Big Brother? Fucking <laughs> <laughs> hell, three, three weeks in a house for 80 grand. Why did you do Big Brother? I'm, I was self-explanatory. Anyway, the same fee was offered for the, the I'm a Celebrity. But the prospector Aye. got away to a fucking jungle and sleep with rats and fucking <laughs> snakes, spiders, the wall, or a house, <laughs> a house in London, right? So it was easy. I chose that, um, and uh, I went in in two thousand and nine, January two thousand nine, uh, and I spent nineteen nights there. It was only it was only for twenty one nights. I got put in the Wednesday and the finals and the. The Friday, uh, so right, I did no bad. Well, and I, and, yeah, I, I did no bad for a wee guy for for Pollock, um, who was hardly known. Was big in a names British. and all. Wasn't there big names. Well, well. Um, my, my, I developed a friendship with Coolio. I didn't never met him before, but we developed friendship. Became pals, seen each other loads of times afterwards. Lovely, lovely guy. Um, also, um, we Vern. Got on well with Vern, unfortunately. Uh, both Aye. of them have now dead, uh, which is um, sad. Um, but with Latoya was on that show. With uh, Eureka Johnson won that show. Um, I had uh, Terry Christensen uh, from Manchester. Um, me and him became pals as well. Me, him, and me, Terry, and Coolio became mates. On we end up just nattering in the early years. I mean, the the thing about Big Brother, Sean, is you'll recognise this for your time in the jail and that is that uh, boredom can be a fucking pain you know you just you're desperate for something today something Aye. different um so when we had the opportunity to just sit and chat and by that time i'd already done a six month sentence in edinburgh i'd done a couple of weeks here and there in greenock and berlin um so i'd done a bit of time so the idea of getting into a house that was i mean there was fucking could date stone right. in your heat, right? right? I mean, honestly, some of the moaning that was going on, I felt like slapping them, you know, <laughs> grow up, you know, all greeting because of, well, we're not getting enough food and we're not getting in. I'm like, oh, fucking. <laughs> anyway, um, George, I'll finish, I'll finish on this, uh, finish a wee story. Because uh, I remember before going on to Big Brother, I, I'd asked uh, George to speak to George Galloway. George and I knew each other for many, many years now through the socialist movement. Um, and uh, I says, George, they've asked me on the Big Brother and he'd already been Aye. on it. I says, any chance you could give me a bit of advice? And he, oh, no problem. We met in the Mar Hall on a Saturday morning. He'd been doing something on the Friday night. We met in the Mar Hall and he says, Tommy, he says, I had it all worked out. He said, I had it in my mind. I was going to write a new book. This was going to be my new book. I knew they wouldn't give me pen and paper, but with all that time, that you were going to have in your hands, I was going to write this new book in my head. That was my plan. He says, by the second day in that house, all I wanted to know was who stole the fucking hobnobs. <laughs> and, and that highlighted to me that what he was warning me about was, Aye. you can go in with all these grand designs, but you'll end up getting consumed with absolute nonsense, Aye. right? Because it's fucking aye, game show aye. and you have to understand it's just a reality show it's no yeah. real life uh, and it was helpful because although I went in and, and took the piss out myself I didn't take it that seriously 
I, if I'd get evicted in the first night, I would have been over a moon. <laughs> right, you still you get your fee. Right. Uh, so I ended up to, to, to be in there 19 nights was a pain in the arse, actually, because <laughs> I was like, oh, for Christ's sake. But anyway, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I really, I was doing a law degree at the time. I was having to pay the fees. I was skint. Um, and it helped. Um, so uh, it was a great personal experience. It was a great financial experience. Um, I missed the wean. Uh, yeah. Obviously, uh, she was only a wean at the time. But um, Gail and and uh, her sister Jillian came down to London several times. They loved Big Brother. I'd never seen it before, Aye. and they loved it. So it was a great experience. I used to love it. I used to like watching in jail. But what a day, Tommy! So, but absolutely brilliant. Have you Just I'll give you the last wee message, right? I'll give you the last wee whatever you've, whatever I've missed or whatever you've wanted to say on here. I'll give you the last wee kind of whatever you want. Sean, to say. all I would say to people is, despite all of the darkness that you and I have discussed here, and and all of the atrocious stories of lost life. We've been talking about Palestine, we've been talking about Iraq, we've been talking about things which are not always easy to talk about. I would still ask people just to dig deep and remember that we're all part of the one race, regardless of our colour, our creed, our religion, and that's the human race. And until we get developed the solidarity, the human solidarity that's required, we're going to always be in war while the ruling class rule over us. Please, do your wee bit in whatever way you can, whatever life you're involved in, please do your wee bit to try and build a better world. Brilliant. Tommy Sheridan, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks.